So welcome to everybody. Uh, this is um, a seminar which is part of, uh, of an ongoing series called um, Constructing Epistemologies of the South. Uh, it, is, um, it is part of the activities of a research and a group and a working group at, uh, at the Center for Social Studies, which deals with um, uh, epistemologies of the South which um, has been uh, have built is a, it's an approach that has been built on the work of Professor Boaventura Sosa Sensus, who is here today and will be talking about it uh, in uh, during our our seminar our conversation today, and um, it uh, it tries to uh, it builds a number of procedures that seek to recognize and validate the knowledge that is produced by those who have been suffering uh, different kinds of injustice, oppression, and domination associated with colonialism, capitalism, and uh, patriarchy in its different forms. Uh, Epistemology of the South actually were built on the idea that, and on the on the feeling that uh, uh, hegemonic forms of uh, of uh, producing knowledge are incapable of of uh, acquainting, and in some case, cases, actually help to silence or to eliminate uh, other forms of knowledge that exist in the world and uh, arise from the struggles of people who of those uh, uh, peoples who groups and the movements that um, struggle against um, against all, all these types of oppression and injustice um, so what we are trying to do in this uh, series of seminars is to promote uh, the exchange, the dialogue, the conversation between different um, approaches and uh, uh, that uh, allow us to get into this um, and to to discuss and to and to deal with these uh, uh, struggles that are trying to 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 produce and promote uh, what we call in the cosmos of the South uh, cognitive justice. Um, so in this um, today, we have two speakers who will, uh, as as usual in this um, in these seminars, we'll have one which is uh, someone from our group. In this case, it's Professor Boventura Sosa Santos, and uh, a guest speaker. In this case, it's Professor Leonard Harris. Just very briefly, I I'd like to just to make a very brief introduction of Professor Leonard Harris. He's a professor of philosophy at the Purdue University in the United States, and he has um, has had a very long from since uh, many years. He has been uh, engaged in uh, uh, work on uh, the what we might call the insurgent black tradition, and uh, particularly in uh, in the United States, so the different forms of resistance and of uh, of struggle. Which have also contributed to the to the to, to the, the the rise of different um, currents in, uh, in philosophy and social science and and social knowledge as well. Yeah. And um, uh, he lately he has uh, he has been uh, he has proposed a number of uh, of, uh, of specific approaches to, for instance, to the question of racism. Uh, by associating it with, with a particular concept, you will also bring to the discussion, which is that of the necro being, and also two approaches that try to uh, also to uh, to to generate uh, knowledge on the the city the these conditions of oppression that are in fact uh, those to to we we want to to bring to light and to uh, also to explore the forms of struggle that are born out of this uh, of these situations. Professor Boventura Sosa Santos is well known of everyone, I think, is uh, uh, Emeritus Director of the uh, Center for Social Studies, of which he was, in fact, he was a founder and uh, and the director of many years. And um, his work and his, his centers precisely on this uh, development of this approach of epistemology of the South, as I I have, uh, have uh, tried to, to to summarize it at the beginning, and um, he has uh, he, he has produced an, an enormous uh, amount of uh, of the work in different areas that are 
that he has always tried to bring together in this approach now with Moses of the South. And he, um, I would, I would recommend in particular for anyone who wants to get deeper into this, uh, his work and into Prisoners of South, I would recommend in particular uh, the, the the reading of uh, uh, one of his major books, which is um, uh, the the end of a cognitive empire, which is published in several several languages and uh, is in fact like a sort of uh, one of the of the of the landmark uh, contributions of Professor Ventura. And uh, so I'll, I'll I'd like to thank Professor Harris and Professor Ventura for being here today, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Professor Harris. Uh, one thing I, I forgot to mention is that both uh, Professor Harris and, and Professor Boventura have been the recipients of the Franz Fanon Lifetime Award of the Caribbean Phil uh, Philosophical Society, which is perhaps a sign of uh, that uh, we'll, we'll, what we will probably witness here is uh, a lot of convergence but also differences that will, we hope, be productive of, uh, mm -hmm. of a very rich uh, dialogue between these two approaches. Knowledge is one out of struggle, which is the, the approach of the uh, knowledge of the South and philosophy born of struggle. That is the name that, uh, mm -hmm. how, how Leonard, Professor Leonard Harris has actually christened his, uh, his, uh, his approach. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to, to now to ask Professor Harris to start. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me and thank you for coming. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't speak Portuguese. I apologize. I'm trying to learn and it's very, my, my language is horrible. Um, uh, so I apologize for not knowing the language sufficiently well to say more than bon dia uh, and um, obrigado, and I don't speak Portuguese. Um, I also want to especially thank Professor Nunes because I didn't know about Professor Dos Santos's work before I read Professor Nunes's article in Pragmatism Today, um, encouraging a dialogue between epistemologies of the South and philosophy born of struggle. So after I read his work, I said, well, who is this guy? As I read about him, and after that, and it's only been about a year, a year and a half ago now, I started advertising epistemologies in the South everywhere. On the Philosophy Mono Struggle website, Philosophy Mono Struggle conferences, uh, the lectures I've given in India, uh, in South Africa. Um, and so I really want to thank Professor Nunes for seeing the link that I never, I didn't know existed. And I want to thank Professor and De Santos will allow me to come to meet him at last in person. Um, um, so without much further ado, what I'm going to do is to talk about um, what counts as philosophy born of struggle. It's a bit of history, it's definition, and focus on two concepts, necro being and the actuarial theory. Um, first, the term philosophy born of struggle comes from an uh, uh, article by Frederick Douglass in Abolitionist. Um, who in 1857 said, let me give you a word of the philosophy of reform. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born in struggle. That was in 1983, I produced a book called Philosophy Born in Struggle. To look at knowledges, if you will, born out of the struggle. What did that look like? And in um, uh, 1993, we established an association, Philosophy Born of Struggle. We held conferences every year since that, 1993, on the topics associated with the book, Philosophy Born of Struggle. In 2020, um, I published a book with Ada Lee McBride called A Philosophy Born of Struggle, which is my view of philosophy born of struggle as such. What does it mean? Part of what it means is that we have a philosophy that says any philosophy, if it's going to talk about morality and social life, has to give you tools, poetry, and imagery, and reasoning approaches um, that are 
beneficial to the least well off. It has to give you some kind of openness, some kind of way of looking at itself, looking at its own structure, and take seriously our corporal reality. So this means that I'm looking for a different way of doing philosophy altogether, fundamentally different than the classical definitions of philosophy as the pursuit of wisdom. The classical definition of philosophy as the pursuit of wisdom tells you what you need is to find true knowledge. But that depends upon a concept of the self, a notion of the self as a unified self. I reject the unity theory of the self. Namely, that the self is an individual thing that has a fundamental cognition over time undiluted. That's a monster. There are no beings like that. There are no unified selves. There are no wise men or women who essentially are the same over time, eternally, who have combined their cognition with true knowledge and ascend above us. There are no persons like that. Philosophy Board of Struggle says, look, let's look at what we really are and ask substantive questions about that. That means that I'm doing philosophy from a very different standpoint. I'm asking some fundamentally different kinds of questions. I don't have the same boundaries between philosophy and sociology that are usual. I'm not romanticizing metaphysics and aesthetics and epistemology. Rather, I'm looking at the, what it is to engage in dialogue across those lines. That places me in a world of doing philosophy very differently altogether different. The philosophy of the struggle comes out of that tradition, the resistance tradition. What then is epistemology of the South? I didn't know about it in existence beforehand, before Professor Nunes. And I read, I said, wait a minute. He's right. There are a lot of common themes that have arisen from very different places that are nonetheless beneficial to one another, if you will. I gave you a list of common things, some of the common things. Abysmal thinking. Very similar to what I mean by necro being. You have a sociology of emergence. We have imagined communities. You have uh, 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 inter intercultural translations. We have what's called equipamoriality of the original text, which means that the original text is as valuable as the translation, that the information in both are significant. You have cognitive justice, but I've developed a theory called insurrectionist ethics. And I'll talk a little bit more about insurrectionist ethics in a minute. You have work on plural rights. Um, the book starts off with plurality, a plural verse. So these are some kind of common discussions, if you will, concepts which arise in philosophy but a struggle that are already there also in epistemology of self. They're correlative, if you will. Um, we have very different histories altogether. And why shouldn't they? If you're claiming that part of what's important is our plurality and our location and our context, why wouldn't you have different orientation? Why wouldn't you have different terms that are very similar if you're doing epistemologies from different locations? Of course. So I really want to thank you for allowing me to enter into this dialogue um, promoted by Professor Nunes and Carson. Um, and those are only some of the concepts that I think are correlative. What then is a philosophy born a struggle? What is an example of it? That's where I want to begin with the concept of a necro being. 
Necro being, as I presented, is that which kills and prevents from being born. Is subject subjection is that what kills by death? I mean, really death. There are different conceptions of death, but they all require the disappearance of the body. At some point, it dies; it's no longer there. And by prevention from being born, I don't necessarily mean abortion. What I mean is that the populations don't get to exist. If a woman is incarcerated, she's more likely not to be a mother. If a man's incarcerated, he's more likely not to be a father. So you have populations that are prevented from being born by virtue of subjection. Racism is a form of necro being. Racism is a polymorphic agent of death. There are a variety of causes for why it exists. No one causes it. It creates premature death. Shorten lives, starving children, degrading insults, stereotypes forcibly imposed. Populations are racialized and subject to conditions of life that confer upon them the status of living dead. Necro tragedy. This is utter suffering and irredeemable loss. One reason necro being is a living death is it's a being that no way will receive continual substantive forms of relief. I consider death, mortality, morbidity, and irredeemable misery as the indicator the sociological indicators of racism across a wide array of the globe. This view is then juxtaposed to an emphasis upon volition, choice. It's not claiming that racism is, is, is that people aren't racist because they have bad beliefs. It says what's really important is who dies, whose life is short. Whose children cannot be born? That's the focus. This means that I see it as a kind of a transfer. A relationship between the dominant and subjective groups is one in which health can be understood as transfer from one population to another. For example, if a black person dies in the United States, and they're buried. Who owns the cemetery? Who owns the caskets? Who produced the caskets? Who's profiting by that? By their early death, we have ceremonies in a church. Who owns the mortgage to the church? Their early death profits those who benefit, the profits those who gain by racism. So their health is extended. They can afford good doctors. So it's a transfer, a theoretical transfer, if you will, of the health of one population to the health of another. The gain. The most salient features then of racism is health. Another way to think of this is that without health, nothing else follows. Whatever else you want to talk about, justice, freedom, rights, liberty, equality, nothing follows without help. That's not metaphysical or essentialist. That's simply a materialist reality. That's what it means to talk about corporal reality, what it is to be a person. On my account, this is fundamentally tragic. The tragic is absolute and meaningless affliction. We are not instruments in the cosmic universe. One way to think about this is what makes this wrong? I mean, we're ever talking about injustice, but what makes it wrong? 
Where's the moral wrongness in this? I take it as a given that it's unnecessarily race-based misery. Shorten lives. That makes embodiment impossible. There are just no moral theories that justify undue death. Especially if you think about the universe as a non-moral universe. Namely, they don't get repaired. There's no justice for them. It's irredeemable. Their harm is not fixed. Health and life assets are independent of revaluation and transvaluation, no matter what your values are. Whether you are uh, 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 Yoruba, Hausa, Fulani, Akan, um, African American, French, German. Ill health is not welcome. Insurrectionist ethics says that, among other things, I need an ethical theory that if I were a slave, it would tell me that I should revolt. No ethical theory on this account is justified if it can't tell you that. Not only has to tell you that, it has to give you some tools. And that may seem simple as a criteria, one criteria. And I'm just gonna focus on that criteria because it's kind of easy to, to explain. Um, that may very well seem, seem simple. But you have to think about what it is to be enslaved. Suppose that you were a woman from um, 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 Czechoslovakia and you were enslaved in sexual slavery. The chances of you getting out of that are slim to none. Suppose you were a slave um, in 13th century Europe. The chances of you getting out of that are slim to none. If you're a slave in the United States, for example, and you're on a plantation, you're going to run away, let's say. You're going to leave your mother behind. You're going to leave your sister behind. The slave master is going to work them more once you leave. He's going to rape your sister, your 13-year-old sister, now, instead of raping you who you were 16, if you were 16. He's going to beat your father. You're going to abuse your brother. So if you run away, you're going to cause harm to the ones you love. There are almost no slave insurrections in human history that were successful. So if you're going to revolt or run away, you're going to harm everybody you know. And you're not going to win. What kind of moral theory is it that's going to tell you run away in the midst of failure? It can't be pragmatic. It can't be utilitarian. It can't be instrumental. It can't be an algorithm. And it can't rely upon consequences. It can't rely upon intrinsic values and virtues. It's got to be poetic. Irrational. It's got to tell you that you need to leave even if you don't leave, even if you decide to stay a slave, it still should tell you you are deserving of dignity. That's insurrection. Let's start there. Don't end there. Just start there. I say start there because reality is that vast majority of humanity has improved its conditions over the last four or five hundred years. People live longer than they've ever lived before. There are fewer wars than there ever was before. There's fewer civil wars. People have fewer illnesses that they do die of that can't be cured now than ever before. 
There are fewer genocides than ever before in human history. But my contention is that we should start among the least well off and ask ourselves those kinds of questions. That's insurrectionist ethic. It does not valorize a unity theory of virtue nor a unity theory of the self. It says these virtues of tenacity and indignation and willingness and self-assurance are good things. Self-reliance is a good thing. Self-respect is a good thing. You'll see a, many of these themes are already echoed in other theories, but those are the theories that I'm uh, pushing. One way to think about this, um, I'm not on, right? Uh, one way to think about this is um, to look at what uh, Michel Foucault called a, 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 a panopticon. A panopticon is uh, a prison. And it's the idea, the idea is that, uh, the idea is that uh, Jeremy Bentham uh, designed a prison. Now, what's the purpose of it? Confinement. But the efficiency of his design, the structure of the design, right, is that the prisoner sits in a cell in a circle. And the police are in the middle of the circle, at least we think he's in the middle, because you don't know whether or not you're being watched. The prisoner will, in effect, watch themselves. The prisoners will watch themselves. They will imprison themselves because they imagine that they are being watched. And by virtue of their imagining that they're being watched, they watch themselves. They don't revolt, even if they're not being watched. They are subserving, intrinsically, in, in, internally subservient, subjective. So use that as a model of contemporary society. However, I use as a model of contemporary in, in, in society a bericado. A slave ship, including Portuguese slave ships, mind you, uh, one of the features of their design was a barrier in the middle of the ship. And on this side of the barrier were the sailors with guns. And on this side were the slaves, slave men and women. If you revolted, the barrier came down. So that on this side, <coughs> men with guns, I can shoot you on the other side, whether you're revolting or not. Whether you're peaceful or not, you die. Whether you're subservient or not, you die. The women on this side prostitute themselves to the sailors for food, water, sustenance. The men are feeling inferior, powerless, useless. Because they can't protect the women and they can't protect themselves. That's a better kind of a barricade. The idea is that one way to see contemporary servitude is that it creates self loathing, it creates harmful behavior. The poor rape themselves. More black people in America kill other black people than police. The most likely person to kill a person who is an immigrant is another immigrant. They engage in ways and behaviors that harm themselves by virtue of the structure of the very economy. Whether you are Peaceful or not, you're part of a collective that is always subject to harm, always facing difficulty. So in that way, 
um, it's a place to start to understand the warrant for a slave revolt as an impetus, so to speak, for the pursuit of dignity in the midst of necro being. In the midst of the slave ship, what do you do? What exactly do you do? Uh, in some sense, that's the condition that I see contemporary racism being. All right. Another concept, and I'll, I'll end with this one, um, is an actuarial theory. The point of the actuarial theory is that, look, explanations are very valuable. They tell us what causes what. Explanations are, are helpful for predictions, but they are limited. They're misleading. They require stable kinds, substitute variables. It isn't that we shouldn't explain things, is that I'm encouraging um, you to also describe depictions, pictures, showing, mm -hmm. show what, the look, what it looks like to not be a beneficiary of justice. Show what it looks like not to have universal interest realized. Picture it. And actuarial theory emphasizes more mort mortality, morbidity, Sure and help. It's a descriptive account. <coughs> the purpose is to see it. Now, this is not reason based. Um, and it's not looking for a global logic of racism. It doesn't say racism in Brazil is the same as racism in, in, in France. It says, look at what the reality is here. Picture it, describe it, including using poetic language. Because groups are very often, especially racial groups, and an absolute. That is, they're not stable. I gave an example yesterday, and I use it today. Uh, you see me as an African American. Right? Um, some years ago, I was also called black. My father was known as a Negro. He didn't understand what on earth you're doing calling yourself black, let alone African American. His father, his grandfather, was known as an African from Guinea. He would know what a Negro looks like. What, when does this concept come into mode? What's the history of it? Groups then are at an absolute, they appear stable, but very often they are not. Some are more stable than others, of course. Classes are more stable than races or ethnicities. But they change. Who is a member of it changes. What the definition of it is changes. Another way to think about it is that um, and there was no place called the United States 500 years ago. What makes you think there's going to be one 500 years into the future? I mean, how does that work? How does that, uh, these names do not exist substantive, as substantive names 500 years ago. What, 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 what account of human history tells you that you have reason to predict that what exists now in the way in which you identify people will exist in the future when you know that the ways in which you identify people now didn't exist? They change. So a depiction helps see what it is that reality looks like now. That's what I mean by the actuarial theory looking at those variables. So let me end. Let me give you a word of the philosophy of reform. 
All concessions yet made to her August claims have been born of earnest struggle. That struggle may be a moral one, that struggle may be a physical one, but there must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without demand, it never did, and it never will. Frederick Douglass, 1857. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Professor Ben Harris, it's such a pleasure to be with you here. Thank you, João, for making this possible. I think this in uh, terms of sociology of knowledge, this is an event, an historical event, I would say. Because uh, we have been uh, writing very similar things. We are both widely read and we didn't know each other, each other's work, to decide, for many, many years. So this happens in academic life. I swore, I swear to all goddesses and gods that I didn't know his work. <clears throat> and of course, Professor Harry just said basically the same. So even though <clears throat> there are people that are struggling for solving some problems of their time, coming from different perspectives, one sociologist, one uh, philosopher, if you are engaged in the same struggles, we came to similar conclusions, even though we don't know each other. So there is uh, what the Germans used to call the zeitgeist of our time. Mm -hmm. The spirit of our time is calling for ourselves, for our approaches, however similar, however different they are, but they are in a sense addressing the same issues, basically. And then you come to such wonderful and surprising commonalities, like for, for instance, born in struggle. Because we came from different trajectories, but we saw similar things. Is that there is uh, power structures in our society. And these power structures very all the time, even though they are also stable, in a sense. And uh, since these power inequalities remain, but change over time, how do they change? Through struggle. Because power never concedes. Relinquishing power. Someone has to, something has to do it. Because the powerful basic instinct is to remain powerful. He may commit suicide, but it's an act of power, actually. So I think that it is very intriguing and at the same time fascinating that we come to very similar conclusions. And when you read Professor Harris and you read my work, you can see that both of us went beyond the chip, the disciplines of our training, be it philosophy or sociology. And in fact, we were searching for basically the same authors in the same places. It's very interesting. For instance, in my work, I have been widely reading the African philosophers and sociologists and historians as Professor Avery's. Sometimes we focus on different authors. We gave uh, more attention uh, to one author or to the other. But in fact, we are in fact paying attention to them. Why? We're also paying attention to the people that in our societies have been suffering most from modern do domination. And in fact, racism, even though we have been calling it Colonialism is a really a crucial element in our theory. So it is amazing from uh, the point of view of sociology of knowledge, our knowledge emerges today and our collectivities and communities, epistemic communities can arise coming from different sources, provided 
that you are not in a fortress in your discipline, but you are looking out for our incompleteness. In fact, my most recent piece, which is not yet published, but is a, well, there was a small article many years ago, but is now being published by a, a journal in, in the UK called the Critical Muslim, it's an Islamic journal, and they invited me uh, to write a piece, and this piece is called Learn Ignorance, uh, which is a concept that I take from a German philosopher from the 15th century, Nicholas of Cusa, that wrote in 1440 a book called Doctor Ignorantia, the learned ignorance. And in fact, I, I think that what I've been looking up to all my life is to be a learned ignorant. I don't know, I don't want to know. Uh, I want to ignore. The more I know, the more I ignore. And the more I ignore, my, the more I know that I need to know more and more. So this idea of incompleteness arising from knowledge is probably the most productive recipe for our universities, for our society. Because if you are incomplete, you don't have all the answers. Because if your culture produces all the answers, why should you be intercultural if you have all the answers? If your philosophy of your uh, knowledge provides all the satisfaction to you, of course, you don't search for the other. And in fact, from my experience as a sociologist, I could see the incompleteness of my knowledge from the very beginning when I start my first PhD research in the favelas of Rio de Janeiro, living in the community. And I could see how illiterate people I was getting my PhD at one of the most elitist universities in the world, Yale University. And these people, however illiterate, how much wisdom they taught me about life, about happiness, about dignity, about self-esteem in the most undignifying conditions of life. So this uh, took me to be more humble in my own way of knowing. And in fact, making almost a decision that my responsibility by being privileged as an academic would be to really account for the wisdom and the knowledge that is all over the world outside our narrow, shrunk universities. And probably this is the reason for the epistemology of, the, of knowledge of, of the South. Because South, in our account, is not a, a, a geographic South, it's an epistemic South. It happens in the North. It happens in the global South, in the global North, whenever there are struggles against domination. And of course, here in Europe, we have lots of struggles by immigrants, by women, by racialized bodies, by sexualized bodies and populations, by regions. In the last one month, it's been, it has been very rich for me because I have been dealing with issues that I hadn't been dealing with before. For instance, I had been in Yugoslavia in, in 1980 when Yugoslavia, one of the most prominent countries of the non-aligned movements, all of a sudden, after the bombing by NATO, uh, Yugoslavia became the Balkans. And the Balkans became, again, a uh, colonized region of Europe with all kinds of problems. Violent Balkanic people, even though it were the Germans that in Saloniki, which is now Saloniki in Greece, rounded up 60,000 Jews and sent them to the God's chambers but not the Germans, the Balkans are considered violent these days in Europe. So I came to know what kind of internal colonialism was going on in Europe, in Skopje, which is now North Macedonia. And then I went to Salonik. And in Salonik, I didn't know that the great modernizer of Turkey, Kemal Ataturk, was born there. Because all this region had been in the Ottoman Empire since the 15th century. And this heritage is absolutely suppressed now. They are almost ashamed. And I saw the abyssal line in the Vana River, on one side, the modern Skopje, on the other side, the Islamic neighborhoods, where the history are, where the mosques are. 
So I could see that in Europe as well. And I arrived yesterday from the Basque country. We had a, 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 a workshop of the Popular University of Social Movements. And I could see how the Basques also considered to be colonized by the Spaniards. And they don't feel in any way Spaniards. They are Basques. And they themselves are in this a transit region for immigrants come from North Africa to the to, to France, and they go through the Basque country. And the Basques are becoming very internationalists because they are helping these immigrants to go to, to France at night in buses. So it was uh, this same impulse from different trajectories, because after all, I, can, I come from a country that in fact organized the trade, the slave trade. Professor Harris is on the other side of the line and we are here together. But the oppression that divided historically that made that if I were in that boat, I would be on one side of the barricade, you would be on the other. The barricade is still there. Not here, I think. So that's why the Ibiza line became so structural for my own way of thinking. And the Ibiza line is there. And these are another common thing. Then I'll go to some differences, and nuances, I will say, is that the Ibiza line for me is, is uh, radical as it is radically invisible. Because we are so much soaked and trained in the idea of universal values, that you, all of us are free and equal after the French Revolution, that it is very impossible, almost very difficult to see that in fact we are not as equal, that this is uh, at most a project, the project of humanity, but it's not reality. Because uh, in our societies, there is no possibility for someone to be human, fully human, without dehumanizing other people. What I call racialized and sexualized bodies, patriarch and colonialism. So this idea of the Bissau line is that it's radically invisible. But the barricade in the ships was strictly visible. The walls, the barbed wire now in, in uh, the southern border of the United States, here between Hungary and the, the Balkan states, in the in Ceuta and Melilla and in, in Morocco and North Africa, they are really very visible. Abyssal lines, the lines, the, the walls between Palestine and being colonially occupied by Israel is also a very visible wall. Is a very visible abyssal line. On one side, full humans; on the other <laughs> side, subhumans. And I usually say, if there's 20,000 immigrants that drowned in the Mediterranean, which is now a cemetery, a liquid cemetery, if they were really American citizens or German citizens or French citizens, would be a major crisis in Europe. But they were brown bodies. They were computer technicians, some of them. They are engineers. With brown bodies coming from Afghanistan, from Syria, from Iraq, from... Uh, uh, Senegal, from Benin, from Nigeria. They are subhumans. Necrobian. Zone of non-being for Franz Fanon. Our common great influence. And I'm so glad that uh, land got this prize many years ago. I got it this year. Next week I'll be in East Lansing to get uh, to receive the prize, the Franz Fanon prize this year. So it is with Angela Davis, which of course is a great pride for me as well, mm -hmm. because we have been together in struggles without uh, uh, looking for these prizes. And the most recent one was uh, we were in the same struggle for promoting and campaigning for Francia Marxist in Colombia, that is now the vice president, the second black woman as vice president of a country. There was one, another, the first one was in Costa Rica, mm -hmm. but didn't uh, stay long. Uh, so Francia is uh, is uh, our uh, common struggle. So I see lots of differences, uh, lots of, of commonalities. Where are some nuances? 
first of all, reading uh, uh, Professor Harris books, one gets the impression that um, Professor uh, Harris could be, uh, in fact, uh, unwillingly uh, producing a general theory of humankind. The human beings, in a sense, are this. Uh, these, for instance, this uh, radical anti-anthropocentrism, in a sense, based on the idea of the self. Because uh, his philosophy, I would uh, classify it, if I may, Professor Harris, as an Ubuntu philosophy, <laughs> because, in fact, as some of you know, I've been very influenced by Bogob Ramosa from South Africa, mm -hmm. and the title of his book is precisely Ubuntu philosophy. There is to say the self does not exist. I am because you are. And uh, so there is no singularity or individual in our lives. So I have uh, been having, probably because I'm a sociologist, narrow objectives. That is to say, I'm trying to characterize modern society since the 15th century, or if you want, since the 14th century, but probably 15th century. That is to say, with colonial expansion. And I think that changes, things changed radically then. And I think that was colonialism, because colonialism, in a sense, forced people to interrupt their histories. They have their histories, they have their empires, they have their forms of oppression and freedom, but all of a sudden, they were imposed an interruption. You don't have history, now you are involved in a different history, another people's history, the global history, which is basically the history of the global expansion of European colonialism. So I think that this fact changed dramatically because it was put together with capitalism. Because of course, colonialism and patriarchy, or even better, hetero patriarchy, have existed for a long, long time. But with capitalism, they were reconfigured. In the way reconfigured because the free labor that is um, premised upon or, or is presupposed by by capitalism does not sustain itself without highly developed labor and without uh, non-paid labor. Slaves, immigrants, brown bodies everywhere are the ones that produce highly developed labor. And women have been producing all the time non-paid labor. And uh, we Marxists, that was my training, I've been decolonizing my Marxism, of course. We even fell into the trap of calling this uh, at most uh, productive labor of women caring for life and producing life as reproductive labor because it didn't produce plus value in Marxist terms because it was not paid, basically. But it was not paid because if it were paid, Business would be impossible. Suppose that uh, our our universities would pay for all the labor involved in our being here. The 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 food, the the taking care of our families and so on. It would be very expensive. So our salaries would go up, and all the workers the same. So it is this idea that as I have come to the conclusion that there are these three main forms of domination, capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. Why I do not call it racism? Because uh, the experiences of colonialism are very diversified in different continents. Because racism, of course, is always there. But what about the expansion, expulsion of indigenous people from their territories for mega projects, for mining projects, for huge dams? for a eolic parks now. Well, it's the same. It's basically the same uh, expropriation, primitive accumulation, if you want, that it was done before under different guise. <coughs> so, and this expulsion, as you can see in Brazil these days, how the Garimpeiros are really invading the indigenous land and uh, uh, a video came out today, yesterday, of the military people say, yes, now we are protecting the getting payers against the indigenous people. 
That is to say, they are in their land. Their land is demarcated. And these soldiers are protecting the people that are invading them. Can you imagine this? This uh, inversion. This is colonialism. So for us, it's very important that colonialism did not end with independence. What ended was an, a specific form of colonialism, historic colonialism. That is to say, colonialism by occupation by a foreign country. So in our, in our way of saying that, in fact, these three main forms of domination, then there are many others. Then there are, if I'm in, 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 in India, I have to include the caste system. If I'm, if I'm, I, I'm in some uh, Middle Eastern countries, I have to include the political uh, religion and uh, the importance of uh, patriarchy in very different ways than they are posed there. But they are usually satellite domination. Saudi Arabia, which is one of the most patriarchal countries in the world, not Iran is much worse than Iran, but now Iran is the target, and and justly so, of course. But uh, we should also target Saudi Arabia. But why? Saudi Arabia is very neoliberal. It's the, at the core of the protection of the oil uh, based on which we are trying to struggle for the we. That is to say, U.S. imperialism is trying to survive in a very difficult time. So I think that this is, would be a nuance. The second one would be that uh, the struggle is, of course, a very common. Uh, I'm not going to enter that. Uh, is that we focus uh, in our work uh, because of our involvement with social movements as much in this uh, radical denunciation as we do with what's called the sociology of emergencies. What is, what is going on? The resistances. So if there is struggle, there is the resistance. Let's look at the resistances. Because we are going through a period in which the global extreme right is growing everywhere. And in a sense, trying to make a natural idea that there is no resistance possible to capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. On the contrary, we should go back to the golden old days of more capitalism, more racism, and more patriarchal and justice. So at this time, social movements and organizations get discouraged very often. And we cannot allow, we intellectuals that are in the academic life cannot allow that to occur. We have to be there to give help them with our facilitation. We are, we are not uh, vanguard theorists, we are rear guard theorists. We go behind with the movements and organizations trying to say, well, we are not alone. When I was now in Basque country, I was telling them, well, but look, the guys in Skopje, in Macedonia are also struggling. We are not alone. Let's compare and let's see the contrast in the different struggles. So this idea of facilitation of the resistances. So if you look at our projects, we have already four books out in, the, in three languages in which we have the alternatives. The alternative different knowledges, knowledge is born in struggle, uh, the collective book with Maria Palomnesis, different conceptions of human rights, the pluri bears of the human with Bruno Serra Martins, demo diversity, different conceptions of democracy with, uh, with Jose Manuel Mendes. We have now the most recent one, uh, the economies of uh, uh, Buen Vivir. The, common, the economies of good living, which are non-capitalist economies, with Teresa Cunha here at the set. So we are trying to amplify the voice of the emergencies of these alternatives, which, as you know, the people that are more familiar with my work, there are three types of emergencies, uh, 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 counter-hegemonic appropriations, ruined seeds, and liberated zones. So there are these three types of uh, emergencies. Finally, I would like to see that uh, I'm, I'm uh, paying a lot of attention and read very closely, so I, I do not evaluate at this point completely Professor Harry's idea of the actuaries as an alternative to explanation, which is very interesting because of this focus on corporality. Uh, and these uh, corporealities, if you read the, the end of the cognitive empire, you see there how the body is uh, 
a very important and the embodiment of, of knowledge much beyond uh, Merleau-Ponty, uh, whose critique I make that uh, in that um, in that book. Uh, what I think that um, is probably very interesting, I have to think about uh, uh, Professor uh, El Rizaidi of health. Probably it was the link through which Juan, because Juan is our specialist on health, and we are publishing the next book will be different conceptions of health. Of health. I forgot to to mention that the, the other book that probably the most recent one well, is now, we are looking to, through the, the proofs with my dear Sara Araujo is here, is decolonizing constitutionalism. And in decolonizing the, the uh, constitutionalism, you'll see alternatives to the colonial state, to the modern state. And the book is will coming out as all of them uh, in Portuguese, in English, and in Spanish. Uh, so this is, this is not yet published, but uh, we are, in fact, now in production. All of them are published in English by Routledge, in Spanish by uh, Acal in Madrid, and in Portuguese by uh, Edison Stenta in Lisbon. So I think that this idea, that's probably the nuance, and I end here, is that the health, health is crucial for Professor Ellis, mm -hmm. because without health, nothing else happens as it's there. I have to think about that because I was uh, I was uh, more inclined that hunger is the key, not health. I may be in poor health, but if I still have some food, survive. If I don't, I won't survive. But Professor Harris think it's health, and this idea of transfer of health. I mean, it's it's amazing his analysis. Because uh, Professor Harris takes my analysis also much beyond what I've been doing. So it is an invitation for me to pursue. Look at what he says about the people when they die, who once were the proprietors of casks, the cemeteries, the ceremonies, the churches, and so on. How much transfer of wealth through the suffering of the majorities in our world? So I, I really think that is the most... Uh, Exciting moment, Professor Ayres, and I've been uh, having lots of exciting, as I mentioned, in uh, this time in Europe. Uh, and next week we'll be on the other continent. But having you here at home and having this kind of discussion, I really thank you for for uh, for this uh, marvelous encounter. And I think we have to read each other. And I I'm sure that probably this is the first of our meetings, but we'll be more. Uh, and um, I'm looking for it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. Thank you.